The following program is sponsored by the RGP Lens Institute and Nikon Corporation. Presenting contact lens biomicroscopy. The biomicroscope, a valuable tool in today's eye care practice. The product of optical, engineering, and electronic technology. The biomicroscope, also known as a slit lamp, is a powerful and versatile instrument. Its wide magnification range, variable illumination system, and unlimited angles of view make it indispensable for viewing ocular tissues and performing diagnostic and treatment procedures, including corneal evaluation, crystalline lens observation, gonioscopy, tenometry, laser procedures, fundoscopy, and contact lens evaluation. In addition, modern slit lamps allow for ocular photography and videography, invaluable tools for comprehensive patient documentation. All modern slit lamps share similarities in design. They have two basic components, a microscope and an illumination system. The illumination system provides a precise and adjustable source of light. It consists of a rotating mirror, a variety of filters and controls for varying the width, height, and rotation of a slit beam. The microscope provides a stereoscopic image at varying powers of magnification. It consists of eyepieces and a magnification changer. Both systems are joined on a movable platform and rotate about a common axis as a single unit or moved independently. A joystick controls vertical, forward-backward, and right-left adjustments. By changing the position of the light source and microscope, various illuminations are produced, enabling any part of the eye to be evaluated. In preparation for patient examination, begin by setting the rheostat to its lowest level before turning on the power. Preset the oculars by turning the eyepieces fully counterclockwise. While viewing an illuminated field, slowly turn the eyepiece with the reticle clockwise until it reaches sharp focus. Next, view through the other eyepiece and turn it clockwise to focus the field. Note these settings for future use. Adjust the interpupillary distance of the eyepieces for binocularity and stereopsis. After seating the patient, Adjust the table to a comfortable working height. Position the patient against the chin and forehead rests. And adjust the instrument so the index mark on the chin rest assembly aligns with the outer canvas. Several illumination techniques are used to observe the various ocular structures. There are two basic categories of illuminations, direct focal and indirect or retro. Direct focal illuminations are produced with the mirror locked in the center or click stop position. The path of the illumination and magnification systems coincide to focus on the same spot on the eye regardless of the position of either system. Direct focal illuminations include diffuse, parallel pipette, optic section, and conical beam. A diffuse illumination is formed by using a wide slit beam. The light source and microscope are separated by 45 to 60 degrees. Magnification begins on low. Diffuse illumination provides an overall view of the anterior segment. It's especially helpful for contact lens evaluation. In our example, the entire field of view is illuminated to better observe the fitting dynamics of a soft lens. Diffuse illumination allows for the evaluation of lens positioning, movement, and coverage. With this lens, there is good movement with the blink, as well as good centration and limbal coverage. Diffuse illumination is used in combination with fluorescein dye to evaluate the spherical rigid gas permeable lens fit on a high astigmatic cornea. 
Fluorescein added to the tears causes them to fluoresce a bright yellow green color when viewed through a cobalt blue filter. The brightness of the tears increases with the thickness of the tear layer, thereby indicating the amount of clearance between the lens and cornea. The area under the lens where the fluorescein is absent appears as black or dark, thereby indicating a position of lens cornea bearing or touch. Diffuse illumination is used in combination with low magnification to observe the overall lens positioning of this RGP lens. There is good movement on the blink and good centration. Moderate magnification provides a better view of the lens surface and tear exchange at the lens edge. Fluorescein evaluation of the same lens reveals a slightly steep fit with an area of central pooling or clearance and a light zone of mid-peripheral bearing. The peripheral curve system which appears as the bright circular ring at the lens edge is also observed. In another example, diffuse illumination is helpful for viewing an epithelial abrasion resulting from PMMA lens overwear. The coalesced area of central corneal staining is enhanced by the use of fluorescein dye. A diffuse illumination changes to a parallel pipette by narrowing the slit lamp beam to about one to two millimeters. The light source and microscope remain about 45 degrees apart. Magnification is generally low to medium. The narrowed vertical slit is focused on the corneal surface. The light beam continues through the anterior chamber to fall on the iris. This illumination is useful for a general survey of the corneal layers as well as viewing scars, abrasions, and corneal nerves. Here, a parallel pipette is helpful for viewing a tear in a soft contact lens. In this example, a parallel pipette is used to view corneal stria, which appear as subtle, thin white vertical folds in the posterior stroma. This complication occurs secondary to contact lens-related corneal edema. A parallel pipette is transformed to an optic section by narrowing the slit width to a thin slice. The angle between the light source and microscope is about 60 degrees, with the magnification at a medium to high setting. The parallel pipette is narrowed to an optic section. This illumination is generally used to view a cross section of the cornea. An optic section helps to differentiate the various layers of the cornea, including the epithelium, the stroma, and the endothelium. A parallel pipette transforms to a conical beam by decreasing the slit height to a small spot. The angle between the light source and microscope is about 45 degrees. The rheostat intensity is set on high and the room light dimmed. Magnification is set high. A conical beam is used to detect the presence of cells and flare in the anterior chamber. Decrease the slit height to fit within the pupil. The two reflections are from the cornea and the front surface of the lens. Begin by focusing the beam on the cornea. Move the joystick forward to focus on the lens. Then move the joystick back half that distance to the midpoint of the anterior chamber. This is the area to view for cells and flare. There are no clinical signs present in this healthy eye. In this example, a conical beam is positioned on a patient's left eye. Careful observation in the space between them reveals a significant haze in the anterior chamber. This is aqueous flare, secondary to acute anterior uveitis. Specular reflection is formed by positioning a parallel pipette to reflect off the corneal surface. The rheostat is at maximum brightness and the magnification is set initially on low. The light source and microscope are separated to about 45 degrees until a bright specular reflex appears in one ocular. This is the point where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. 
specular reflection is primarily used for viewing the corneal endothelium. Zoom to the highest magnification. A bright image is observed with a duller image adjacent to it. Adjust the joystick slightly to focus the duller image to bring the endothelial mosaic or texture into view. Any irregularity in the endothelial surface is enhanced by this illumination. In this example, endothelial guttata present as small dark patches in the mosaic reflex. These are areas of endothelial cell dropout, often caused by contact lens-induced hypoxia. Our next segment presents the second category of illuminations. Indirect or retroilluminations are formed by rotating the mirror out of click stop. The focal points of the illumination and magnification systems are no longer coincident. Retroilluminations allow a semi-transparent structure to be viewed against an illuminated background. Retro is useful for determining the density and boundaries of lesion types found in the cornea. A simulated corneal lesion is used for our demonstration. Starting with the parallel pipette, the lesion is viewed by direct illumination. The slit beam is moved out of click stop until the light reflecting off the iris is directly behind the lesion. This is called direct retroillumination because the lesion is directly in the path of the reflected light. Moving the slit beam further out of click stop results in indirect retroillumination. The light path is positioned adjacent to the lesion to diffusely illuminate it from behind. Returning the beam again demonstrates direct retroillumination. Continuing further returns the beam to the direct parallel pipette view of the lesion. Indirect retroillumination is used to observe the surface deposits on a soft lens. It is easy to view the surface characteristics in the area adjacent to the direct beam, whereas this detail is washed out by the intensity of the direct beam itself. In this example, direct retroillumination is used to observe soft lens surface deposits. The light reflecting off the iris illuminates the deposits from behind. Retroilluminations are used to observe scars, pigment deposits, surface irregularities, and crystalline lens opacities. Another out-of-click stop illumination is sclerotic scatter. With the microscope focused on the cornea and the magnification set on low, position the illumination system at about 45 to 60 degrees. The light source is taken out of click stop and rotated to focus a broad slit beam at the limbus. A halo of light is observed around the entire limbus as the light is transmitted throughout the cornea. This illumination allows the limbal coverage of the soft lens to be easily seen. The normal cornea appears dark since the light is being internally reflected. This illumination may be observed directly without the use of the microscope. Corneal abrasions, edema, scars and vacuoles are also observed with sclerotic scatter. In this example, sclerotic scatter illumination is used to view central corneal clouding, or CCC, a secondary complication of PMMA lens wear. This circumscribed region of corneal edema presents as a grayish stromal haze against the dark background of the pupil. Another useful illumination is tangential illumination, which uses a broad diffuse beam. The microscope is focused on the cornea, and the illumination system is positioned at the temporal canthus. The light source is focused near the limbus, and the iris and cornea are obliquely illuminated. This view enhances the surface details of the iris. Now that you are familiar with the basic illuminations, here are some clinical conditions that are commonly encountered in contact lens practice. Corneal desiccation, or 3 and 9 o'clock staining, viewed with diffuse illumination in combination with fluorescein dye and a cobalt blue filter. The condition, also known as punctate staining, pertains to the drying of the cornea adjacent to the lens edge. Over one half of RGP lens wearers are affected by this condition in varying degrees of severity. 
In this example, the superior limbus is viewed with the patient's eye and down gaze. Changing to high magnification, retroillumination reveals corneal neovascularization. The blood vessels extending into the cornea are easily viewed against the illuminated iris in the background. This condition can be caused by corneal hypoxia, mechanical irritation, and infection, often due to contact lens wear. Poor wettability of an RGP lens is viewed with diffuse illumination. It often results from the initial non-wettability of the lens material itself or from residual pitch left on the surface after manufacturing. Here, diffuse illumination is used to view a common soft lens problem, surface deposits. The most frequent deposit is a mucoprotein haze or film. This drying of the mucin layer on the lens surface can result in lens discoloration, blurred vision, and lid inflammation. Lipid deposits are also commonly formed on the surface of soft lenses. A parallel pipette is used to view these semi-opaque and oily deposits. Though diffuse illumination allows a paracentral soft lens tear to be observed, especially after the blink, the use of the retro illuminations are more helpful for viewing this condition. The tear is clearly visible in indirect retro, and even more so using direct retro, where the light reflected off the iris illuminates the tear directly from behind. Note the lipid surface deposits observed in the area of the tear seen in both direct focal and retroillumination beam paths. Eversion of the upper and lower lids is an important procedure for determining if giant papillary conjunctivitis or GPC is present. Diffuse illumination is commonly used for this evaluation. The papillary hypertrophy is best outlined by the use of fluorescein application. GPC is common to soft lens wearers, often resulting from a gradual reaction to lens surface deposits. The biomicroscope is a versatile and powerful instrument. Those who are skilled in its use can better assess ocular health, pathology, and contact lens fitting and evaluation. Refer to the other programs in the CLMA RGP Lens Institute video library designed to help eye care practitioners, students, and assistants enhance their professional skills. This program is sponsored by the RGP Lens Institute, the educational division of the Contact Lens Manufacturers Association, and by Nikon Corporation, a leader in precision ophthalmic instrumentation.